want to tell you, Pastor TJ has a long history as a pastor. He's the fifth generation of pastors in the family. He's been a pastor with Calvary Chapel, Melbourne for nine years. He's also currently the pastor of the Vieira campus of, of Calvary Chapel, Melbourne, where he served between 2,500 and 3,000 Christ followers every week. I know Pastor TJ uh, has a great message because he's also the pastor of Calvary Chapel Academy, where we teach preschool, elementary, and junior high school students. Let's give Pastor TJ a great message. tell you all the other stuff that he had on me. So, <laughs> I guess we'll save that for afterwards. But it's, it's a blessing to be with you guys. Um, barbecue is a pastime of mine, and so it's a blessing to be here to teach at a, a bit barbecue place. And so, we'll go ahead, and I'm going to go ahead and read the scripture to you that we're going to be diving into today. As I was studying, I, I was reminded that really, God has called us to have a good life. But a good life only comes through living a godly life. Now, what we look at as the word good does not always translate what we would think of being good. But God is good. And God is always there for us and guiding our paths if we listen to Him and follow His direction. Let me go ahead and read this scripture and uh, then we'll pray. Psalms 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit at the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates on it day and night. He is like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit and season, and whose leaf does not Wither. Whether he prospers, not so with the wicked. They are like the chaff that blows when the wind blows it away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, Lord, Your Word is so true. And Lord, You gave us this Word today to live by, to, to, to learn from, and to be able to pass on. Lord, Your Holy Scriptures were provided by You for us to be able to live that good life that only comes through living a godly life. Lord, speak to us today as we look at Your Scriptures and Lord, thank you that your word never returns void. But Lord, there is a type of passion that comes through your word. There, we can see your heart as we look at these scriptures. So Lord, we need that today. We need your passion and we need your heart. So Lord, teach us as we look at this together. In Jesus' name, we all said, Amen. 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 You know, when you look at the scriptures, sometimes people will say that, you know, it's all about laws, it's all about rules, all regulations, all of those things. But when we look at even some of the, the laws that we have in our United States, some of them are extremely bizarre. Did you know that North Carolina is against the law for a bingo game to last, last longer than five hours? Did you know that in Ohio, it is okay and encouraged for a policeman to bite a dog? If they think that it will calm him down. In Gainesville, Georgia, not Florida, not Gainesville, Florida, oh no. In Gainesville, Georgia, you are only allowed to eat fried chicken with your hands. Alright? Now, please, please, please don't eat your whole pork tonight today with your hands. God has given you utensils to use. In Washington, you can be arrested or fined for harassing Bigfoot. All right. now, these are ridiculous and bizarre. But God did not call us or give us laws that are ridiculous. His laws are not bizarre today. 
As we unpack this scripture, uh, may we be encouraged and may it strengthen us knowing that our Lord gave us rules and regulations to live by to give us blessing. Knowing that God and His covenant that He made with Israel many years ago passes on to us that they, with our obedience there will be a blessing that comes along. You see, from the beginning of humanity, God encouraged His creation always to follow His ways. We read in the book of Deuteronomy 28, verse 1, it says, If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully, carefully, that's important, follow all of His commands that I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations. All those blessings will come upon you and accompany you if you would only obey the Lord your God. You see, we, we know that the word obedience, it means to hear God's voice, to accept His authority as God, and to do what He commands. So we see this train, we see that it goes from the ears, it goes from the eyes, and then it goes to the mind. It goes into the mind. We have to say, I accept God's authority. And then it goes to our hearts. And the next thing you know, after it burns a fire in our hearts, it is set to our feet and our hands to show the love of God. And that obedience, we show our love of God by obeying God. Now, disobedience is it, totally the opposite. It means to refuse to hear God's voice, to reject His authority, and to not do what He commands. God did not create us to be disobedient, but He created us to follow Him in the Scriptures. My grandfather, who was a pastor in this area for many years, he, he, he stated it this way, success does not come by making popular decisions. It comes by obeying God. That's the blessed life. That's the good life. Of knowing that we are going to follow God and then leave all the consequences up to Him. No matter what it is, no matter where He takes us, knowing that it comes into our head and through our eyes and then into our heart and into our feet. You see what happens is when we obey God, God will never disappoint. He will never disappoint us. You see, our obedience is like a circle. And our obedience, paired with God's faithfulness, which encompasses part of our obedience. And then we see in the middle, when those two things collide, when they come together, incredible things happen. Because God is always faithful. That circle is always complete. The thing that needs to be paired in for that and those incredible things is our obedience. Our obedience needs to encompass God's faithfulness because He's always there. And He's always faithful. Now, success does not come by making popular decisions, as we said. It comes through obedience. It comes through our feet moving forward. I do believe that it's important for us, as men in this room, knowing that when we take small steps of obedience, it leads to big steps of faith. We might be taking just a small step that we know that God told us to do, and following His obedience. <laughs> But in the, the background, it leads to these huge steps of faith that God, we never maybe thought that we ever could do with God. We never thought that we could do that. But God called us to do it. So obeying God in the small matters is so essential for us to receive God's blessings. So we need to obey God. We need to obey what He tells us to do. And I always think that it's so incredible that this right here... This holy scripture in which I have in my hand gives me that direction. It's this that gives my life purpose. It's this that shows me how to be a dad. It's this right here that gives me rules to live by for God's glory, not for my own. As we look at Psalms 1.1, it says that blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of the sinners, or the seat of mockers. We see this part of the scripture here. 
And we see that we are to be wise, we are not to be foolish. Proverbs 13, 20, it says this, it says, Walk with the wise, and you will become wise. Associate with fools, and you will get in trouble. Have you ever told your children that? <laughs> my son Jamie. Oh, my son Jamie. What a pill he is. And he has to try hard. It's a conscious decision that he has to walk as though he was wise. And it's interesting because God calls us to walk with him. And is he wise? Yes. And so when we are walking with God, we are walking with the wise. And we are walking with other followers of Christ. Who are those true Christ followers. We're walking with the wise. I grew up here in Florida. And um, I remember being a kid. And we would run through a pasture that we had. And the pasture it had all kinds of different kinds of plantation in it. But it always had this one. It seemed like no matter where we would go, we would get it all over us. And it was hitchhikers. Yeah. Do you remember those? Those yeah. little things. I used to feed them to my cats. <laughs> you know, those little things that you get on your socks or those little things that you would get on your legs. And it seemed like no matter where you went, you would pick things up and it would just collect to your pants and you'd have to pick them off. Your shoelaces? Oh my goodness. <laughs> How long I would have to take pulling these hitchhikers off my shoelaces. Or sometimes you would run through a field that was not very manicured and you would get sand spurs. Remember those. They would just collect on you. Do you know that for us to be righteous, there are things that we are to do and there are things that we are not to do. But always know that there are places that we should never, ever go. That's the same thing it is with those hitchhikers. When we walk through a certain area, we are always picking things up. Things just attach to us. And things attach to us, and we have to take time to pull them off. We have to take time to remove them. But that's the same thing it is when we are not walking with the wise. We start picking up these things that attach to our lives. And a lot of times, it's the same thing that we are to do with God and obey. It kind of comes in our ears or our eyes, and then it adapts to our hearts. And let me tell you something. I've had a hard heart before. It's hard to soften. And that's an act of God. But God does not want us to pick up these things of the foolish, but only of the wise. We see this godly warning as we look at this scripture. God says, don't do those things. I have something better for you. It's not that God wants to just put all these rules on us. He says that he has something better. Something more powerful. Something more important. God is not trying to keep us from things. He's encouraging us to live a better life where that has benefit for Him. Today, I think it's very important for us to continuously remember who we're doing life with. Are we doing life with the wise and with God? Or we find ourselves kind of over here a little bit more where we're doing life with the ungodly, the unwise. Now, you see that Satan is patient. And he's always moving and trying to get us to move away from God. Remember what it says in 1 Peter 5 8. It says, Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. You see, the way that Satan works, he tries to kind of get you in a situation that is always there. A couple of months ago, I was watching one of the Discovery Channel videos with my son. Not my son, Jamie. My son, William. My son, William, he's six years old and he's a little bit more tender. And we were watching and I was like, oh, look at that lion. Look at that lion. Look at him go. He's just kind of creeping through the woods, kind of hiding behind the grass. And then we see this beautiful gazelle. You well, know, those are some beautiful animals. And then we see this lion, and I'm like, oh, look at him, look at him, look at him. And you know, it was in the middle of the day. I did not think that they would show carnage on the show. <laughs> and so this lion jumps out and devours this, this animal right in front of my son, William. 
whose eyes got bigger than I've ever seen before, who hid his face from the carnage, and I'm like, yeah, get him, get him, and then I remember who I'm sitting with. But that's the way that Satan works. He's always looking for that moment for you to be in a place that you're not supposed to be in. You've removed yourself from the pack. And then he devours. Here's something wise for us to remember. When we notice one of our brothers, maybe who's not coming to field for a while, or maybe not a part of your study or your church, and you see him remove himself a little bit. He is very, very vulnerable for that attack. It is wise for us to remember that God loves it when we do life together. Reach out to that brother. Maybe right now, if we're sitting here and you're thinking, you know, I do have a friend that is kind of strayed. Go get him. Bring him back in. Encourage him to be a part of this body. To be a part of what God is doing. We see here in uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 9, it says this. It says, that when I wrote to you before... And this is, of course, Paul. I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin. But I was not talking about unbelievers who indulge in sexual sin. I was talking, I was not talking about unbelievers who indulge in sexual sin, or who are greedy, or cheat people, or worship idols. You would have to leave this world than to avoid people like that. You see, God placed us here strategically in this community in which you live in to be able to do life around with your brothers and sisters, but also with sinners. God said that we were not to be in a, a holy huddle. You know, if we were to start another building project at our church, let me tell you something that we would not do. We're not building condos. <laughs> All right? Because we are supposed to live in the community that we are in. God never called us to avoid those people. He called us to show them who God is. And that's by us living that life out for Jesus Christ. You know, we're, gonna, we're getting ready to put a sign up on the outside of our exits at the Vieira campus. And the sign on the back side as people are leaving it is going to make this statement. It's going to say, you are now entering the mission field. We are to be the salt and the light of this world. How true it is for us when we leave this little holy huddle, <laughs> full of barbecue, little stains on our shirt, whatever, that we are entering into the mission field in which God placed us to be in. We need to always remember that. You know, we might be living with People that do not know God, which we would see as being foolish in the scriptures. But God called us to live that life pure and holy and pleasing to Him. So that we can show them who Jesus is. Today might be the only day that they get to see Jesus as you walk by. Because who lives in you? So we have an important purpose here. You know, for us... As we look at this next part of the scripture in the book of Psalms, it says this. It says, But his delight in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates on it day and night. You know, we're always meditating on something. You know, on Monday night, you know, I spent a little bit of time meditating on the football game. Anybody watch that? Aaron Rodgers, good grief. But God called us to be meditating and diving in to His Word daily. If not, I'm not ready for that mission. I'm not only not walking with the wise, I'm not being wise myself. We need to make sure that we are taking that time to really dive in to God and to His Word. That Scripture clearly points it out, what we see all throughout the Scriptures of diving into God's Word. We see that contrast here of the world and the Word. It is a clear, distinct thing. God called us to live in the Word and the world. 
but let the word, Jesus Christ, shine through us. Remember Romans 12, 2. It says this, it says, Do not let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold, but let God remold your minds from within so that you may prove and practice that the plan of God for you is good and meets all his demands, moving towards the goal of true maturity. You see, what that's saying is saying that God does not want the world around us to squeeze us into its mold, but God wants us, by the way that we live, showing people who God is and directing them. J.B. Phillips makes this statement. He says, I don't care what the world is doing. I'm not going to let it squeeze me into its mold. I'm going to live life the way that God wants me to live it. We can so easily be squeezed into the mold of this world. I have a um, cousin who moved to England. And uh, she had lived in Florida all her life. She moved to England for about two months. And uh, she comes back into town, and lo and behold, England had squeezed her into its mold. She was speaking with an English accent. <laughs> now, I think she was really trying to do it, too. But so quickly, two months, living in Florida for 30 years, and then moving away for two months, and next thing you know, she's English. I think her teeth were even starting to look bad. I don't know. Oh, so, <laughs> oh, sorry, the English guy's here. I'm sorry. But God says don't let that happen. God says that we are to live the way that we are to live by living the way of the Word of God. You know, when it's interesting to think of being squeezed. You know, living in Florida, we would go up to the tree in the morning. We would take a orange and you'd squeeze it. A lot of times you could not actually know what was going to come out by the way that it looked on the outside. Each one of us, when we get squeezed in this world today, pressure, emotions, disappointments, it's very, very good for us to look at what is coming out. Because that is proof to us if we are a good fruit, or bad fruit. And so when that squeezing process happens, watch to see what comes out. When you see your brothers, encourage them. If you see something that's not good coming out of them. So when that squeezing process works, I know as a pastor, you know, with staff and volunteers, I'm always watching to see how they handle stress and pressure. Because that's always a great test to be able to see what's really going on in their lives. And so when we have a leader, that when they squeeze and you taste something sweet, you know that that is a good harvest. That is something that, that God is doing. Now other ones that you see, and when they're being squeezed, you know, just like that, that orange that you're squeezing over, and next thing you know, just all this black stuff comes out, and you're like, that's disgusting. That allows you to know it. If that fruit is not good, on the outside it might look amazing. But God wants us to be squeezed and molded to his image. And so that when we pour out and when stress happens, we're pulling out just goodness. Because the world around us today, they are always watching how we handle these situations. Oh, here comes the true test. Let's see how they handle this. Let's see if they really are who they say they are. They really are who they say they are in Jesus Christ. So I'm going to leave you guys with this, this last question. I'm always thinking that I'm going to get through more scripture than I actually do. But I'm going to leave you with this last question. This is a question that I ask myself daily because I'm always reminded from a quote that's on my wall. Today, you are fast becoming what you are going to be. Each one of us is becoming something. Are we becoming more and more like our Heavenly Father? Our Savior? Or are we becoming more like what we just read in that first verse, like the foolish? Are we becoming more like Jesus? 
Are we becoming more like the foolish? Are we becoming more like the Word of God and the Son of God? Or are we becoming more like the world around us? Where are we at? And then I want you to picture this. I want you to think of where you want to be in Christ Jesus and who you want to be. Because today, we can become more like Him. Even if earlier in the day we were becoming more like the world because we are fast becoming what we are going to be. Let me encourage you with this last thing. Be more like the Lord. Make it your goal to show Him to this world and to show Him who Jesus is. I'm going to go ahead and pray for us. And But I like that you would just continuously look at that this week and think about, are we becoming more and more like Jesus today? Lord, Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank You so much that we have You as our model. Lord, thank You so much that in Your Scripture, and Your Word, that You showed us and told us how to do life the right way. We don't have to wander around wondering what we're supposed to do when Your Word tells us that we are supposed to be obedient to You. And you clearly outline that to us. Lord, for maybe some of us that are in this room that have not been living maybe the way that you would have us to live, Lord, I would ask that you would just encourage them. And knowing that today is a new day, this minute is a new minute, and Lord, that this minute is, it is to be closer to you than we've ever been before. Maybe those that have been encouraged by your word and, and love you, Lord, maybe have, haven't been as obedient as they're supposed to be. Lord, I ask right now that we would just hand those disobedient areas over to you. Lord, maybe that you would reveal them to our hearts right now so that we can just hand them right to you. And Lord, thank you so much for what your word tells us that, that when those things happen, you don't look at those things again because we are a new creation all over again in, in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we thank you and we praise you. But, Lord, may we be closer to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, guys. The, the, the whole squeezing, we all get squeezed, you know, different ways. And, and one of the ways that we didn't mention that we can be squeezed is by success. Mm -hmm. Because some people can be squeezed and become successful, and then that will lead them to think that they're doing it and not God mm -hmm. going through them, and then take those gifts that God gives them and not share them with others. So I just want to mention that's another way that people can be screened. That's true. That's true. You know, possession can cripple us too. You know, mm -hmm. you know we're always striving for possession. Last last night on the Wednesday night service, I was talking a little bit about my daughter. She's uh, four, 15 months old, and she's always grabbing things. <laughs> and so she's got. She knows what a telephone is. Everything's a telephone, a book, <laughs> you know, whatever. And so she's got all these things, and uh, she fell down. And she's laying there, and she didn't want to let go of these things to get herself up. So she's just laying there, holding on to these possessions. Possessions can cripple us. And so, so can success, like you're saying. You know, that can keep us, because God, he, he wants us to stay focused. Satan loves to get us sidetracked. And when we're getting sidetracked, we are not staying focused on what God has for us. It's a great point. What have been hitchhikers in your life? Okay, good question. Something that's attached itself to me. Oh man. I'm I'm a very driven person. And when I was younger, I was um, diagnosed with dyslexia. And so I repeated uh, when I was in second grade, I was already four years older than most students because I had repeated so many grades, they held me back, they had to try to help me. I think a hitchhiker to overcome that has been a big deal in my life, where I just wanted to prove all those people wrong, where I had a teacher when I was in junior high tell my parents, you need to go ahead and talk him out of his desire of going to college. And so that was a really driving force, and I think sometimes, even though that's, that's a good thing to be driven, sometimes you can, you can overdrive, that you can kind of be focused on that instead of what God has for you. Now, did I send my teacher 
a copy of my diploma. <laughs> did I send her a copy of my straight A's back to seminary after my bachelor's? Yes, I did. But <laughs> I'm really joking. Uh, but I would say that that's been a huge, that's something that I always have to check. I always have to check that, of making sure that I'm not being, you know, successfully driven, but I'm driven for God. And so, and then I always got this, you know, my grandfather was very successful, and he wrote his first book when he was 35, and I just turned 35 this year, and so I've got that on my back too, that, you know, I'm going to write a book this year, you know, a month before he did. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I don't know if that's something, but that's something that has really been a big deal in my life of trying to overcome, overcome those things. Well, thank you, Pastor TJ. Oh, I, got, I got one more question. I don't know. That leads right into the legacy of, you know, Jamie and you're being a grandson of him and that. But tell us some of the things that that has been a benefit for you and some of the things that that's been a, maybe not so much a benefit for you in, sure. in your own career and, and uh, walk. Um, when I was, my grandfather died when I was 12, and uh, two years before he died, he brought me all over the world with him. And so it was something weird, I don't know how it even happened, but um, I got to travel all over the world with him. I was in conference rooms underneath tables. I was uh, all over the world praying for these leaders. You know, uh, Corey Tim Boom stayed in my bedroom. Um, just, I got to really experience a lot of that and to see that, but then also see a man that was very flawed, but very real and open about all of his flaws. And so I got to really experience real life ministry um, at an early age, even though I didn't even really know what I was doing. He was Papa. Um, and so that was, that, was, that was huge for me. Now, some of the struggles with that was um, I kind of dealt with pressures from that too where he prayed for me to before he died to take over his church I was 12 so there's pressures there always thinking you know that I was supposed to do that um, and always continuously giving that to God now it's interesting that right before he died he was walking a cow field um, now today known as Calvary Chapel saying that he was going to move the church to that location Wow. And so, and I remember I was at the ball field across the street, and my dad and him were walking that cow field, and I went over there and walked it. And now that's exactly where the sanctuary is in Melbourne. And so, you know, God puts all that together. Maybe God, you know, a lot of times with prophecy and things like that, we don't, we don't really know what that looks like. Only God does. He gives you little glimpses and little things. Um, but that, that's been something, thank you for that question, that's been something that I've always tried to, think about and has been something hard to overcome sometimes. So. Right. Can we pray for you? Yeah. Great. Right. Thank you, John. Father, we thank you for TJ. We thank you for all that he represents in you, Christ, and, and his presence here in this community, his commitment to this community and to the furtherment of the gospel and the kingdom in this expression, in this place. And Father, we ask that you bless and anoint him. Father, if there's a book on his heart, Lord, that you would give him a clear path to offer that. And that it would be his book. And thank you for the legacy that he lives under. And thank you for all that you've done in, in anointing his path. May you be glorified, Lord, through him. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. lead singer of the Newsboys uh, quote Christian music group. Uh, he has a, a great personal testimony. Uh, should be a very interesting meeting. And finally, um, Pastor TJ was talking about us being on a mission field when we leave Sunny's or leave anywhere. But we can be on a mission field right here. Sunny's is fine, kind enough to donate our meal, but we leave offerings to defray uh, their donation. And 
And I hate to say it, but waitresses often say that we're Christians, they hate to work the Sunday noon shift. Really, Christians are the worst tippers of anybody. So be generous. Show them that we're generous and God drives us to help the people around us as well. We'll see you all next week. Amen. 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 Amen.